Good morning. This is Lori DeToro from Emate and Fluke. Thank you for joining us for this month's Best Practices webinar. As software and sensor providers, we offer an array of webinars and other education, including product demos and product training. Our Best Practices webinar series focuses not on software, but on maintenance strategies and solutions with speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their knowledge. If you've attended one of our webinars in the past, you aren't having problems with your speakers. Mrs. Rona Palmer is retiring at the end of this month and I will be the new moderator for the best practices webinars. Rona, I will do my best to fill your shoes and thank you for everything you've done to make our best practices webinars successful. We wish you all the best in your new adventure. We are pleased today to have with us John Burnett from Fluke Corporation, who will be presenting today's topic, which is condition monitoring with simplified vibra vibration screening. John Burnett is a mechanical application and product specialist for Fluke with more than 30 years of experience in maintenance and operation of nuclear power plants and machinery and other plants. John has worked with customers in all industries implementing reliability programs and is a certified category two vibration analyst with more than 20 years of experience diagnosing machine faults and a certified maintenance reliability professional. John served in the US Navy as an electrician for 12 years. Before John gets started, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. Today's session is being recorded, so the phone lines will be muted to minimize background noise. We will save time after the presentation for attendee questions. You can use the questions feature on GoToWebinar to submit your questions or comments at any time during John's presentation, and I will read them to John so he can respond during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. If you would like to receive a copy of today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of today's session. The recorded webinar will be available on EMAT University on the EMAT website best practices page. We'll go ahead and open up the floor for questions. And while we're doing so, um, we're going to let John get started. Take it away, John. Okay, thanks, Lori. Hello, everyone. My name is John Burnett, and I understand the struggles that teams face day in and day out because I started my career as a planner, then a maintenance supervisor. For many years as a consultant, helping hundreds of customers in everyday industry as they see hurdles to improve plant uptime and reduce costs. Now at Fluke, as we work with customers on their journey to improve reliability, we find that there's no silver bullet or magic box, but we have learned from our customers what has worked and what doesn't work in the real world. Okay, John, we're gonna launch this poll and um, Everyone, please answer in just a moment. Um, what level of interest do you have in using vibration monitoring? You can select, I use it regularly. I occasionally use it. I have used it, but I'm not now. I don't use it for plan to, or I have no plans to use it. We'll give everyone a few minutes to respond. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now. We've had a good number of people who have responded. So let's look at the results. Um, about 24% say they use it regularly. 45% uh, say they don't plan it, don't use it but plan to. 15% uh, use it occasionally. And 13% um, um, have used it but are not now and only 3% have no plans to use vibration monitoring. So John, there's the information on that and we can move forward to um, the next part of the webinar. Okay, well thanks, Lori. So let's start off uh, kind of at the top, you know, and, and what's what's current, what are the trends? And over the, the, the past, oh, 20 or 30 years, you know, we've seen uh, maintenance industries go through a lot of changes. And recently, in the last few years, um, there 
in this, all teams are having the same problems. We're all having to do more and more with less and less. Um, we're having uh, a lot of our skilled experts are retiring and they're not being backfilled with experts. We have uh, less budgets. We have uh, uh, less people. We have, uh, and at the, the whole time this is happening, production goals are increasing and machines are becoming more complicated. So the three main drivers of this problem, um, we've kind of, I've kind of already said these, but they are the workforce is shifting. We're seeing a lot of experienced, skilled experts leaving and the new uh, workforce coming in uh, aren't as, um, you know, you know, I, I wouldn't, as skilled, they haven't gone through the years of training, but they have to do more with less and uh, they're uh, more technologically uh, advanced, I'd say. Um, maintenance is becoming more complex with uh, machines are becoming more automated. We have more variable frequency speed, uh, variable drive uh, motors. We've got auto start and stop machines. Machines are getting complex. Our tech manuals have uh, zero information in them and uh, the, whole, the whole time our budgets are going away because uh, if we don't use it one year, it's gone the next. And so it, it's to a point where everybody is going, what, what do we do? We, we can no longer run things the way they've been going. So what do we do? You know, do we just give up? Do we, uh, uh, how, how can we do this? Well, let's, let's talk about some ideas and uh, none of these ideas are brand new. They've been around for a while. So let's talk about some ideas. So first of all, we all know we want to be more proactive and proactive maintenance allows us to have time to schedule repairs and acquire parts. Proactive maintenance means that machines aren't blowing up and it's safer and we're not having to do emergency work orders, which means we take risk. Increased maintenance intervals. Machines are lasting longer if we're using proactive maintenance. And if the machine is lasting longer, that means the cost and repairs are going down and production is going up. So that's all looking good. Reliability, you know, fewer problems are happening that we don't know about. We can plan our repairs. And this makes our peace of mind better. I mean, we all want to have uh, a better, uh, you know, work environment and feel healthy. And all of these things on paper sound great. And everybody is uh, nods. And for the past 30 years, we've all been trying to do this. But in the real world, what we found over the past 20, 30, 40 years is that on paper, it looks great. Everybody wants it, but then we run into issues. So let's talk about that. The first, there's three choices. One is reactive maintenance. We've all heard about this, run to failure. We know that you have a lot of uh, unplanned downtime. You have a lot of production losses. It's a stressful work environment, a lot of overtime. A lot of people call this firefighter maintenance. You just run around with a couple of fire extinguishers trying to put on fires. It's not the way we run a plant and it's getting progressively worse. We just can't continue to run in a reactive mode. Then we have preventive maintenance, PMs. This isn't new. I was doing PMs in the Navy back in the 80s and I was a PM coordinator in one of the engine rooms uh, of a cruiser and my full-time job was to coordinate PMs and we would do weekly PMs and annual PMs and PMs to check that we're doing the right PMs. It was, it was, it was crazy. And what we found out back then, uh, and, and this was studies done by the U.S. Navy in the 60s, the airline industries in the 60s, and every industry has done a study and come up with the same numbers, and that is we seem to be repairing machines that don't need to be repaired and quite often we'll overhaul a machine even though it was overhauled just last month just because the PM says to do it. And more importantly, the studies have shown that machine failures on rotating machinery, so I'm not talking about heat exchangers and filters which, which PMs are really needed, but for rotating machinery, doing a calendar-based maintenance on a rotating motor pump, fan, compressor, blower, we find that failures don't happen on, based on a calendar. They happen randomly. So if they happen randomly, then a PM program is only 15% effective. 
So this is better than reactive maintenance, run to failure, but it's not perfect by any means. So then we've all talked about predictive maintenance or trending and or condition-based maintenance. So instead of basing our repair on the failure of a machine or based on the calendar, we base it on the condition of the machine. Again, none of this is new. We've all heard about this. And we know that if we use condition-based maintenance, this allows us to know when the machine is good or bad, and we do a repair based on that, not based on a calendar, not based on failure, and all those benefits that we see over on the left that everybody wants, we can see those benefits. So if it's so good, why aren't we doing it? Well, because there's some hurdles. Everybody has, is doing more with less, and you're already 100% busy with your PMs and your repairs. Nobody has the time to do condition-based maintenance. So we need to find some creative ways to do this. So let's look into some ideas, and this is based on what our customers have shown us, because many customers have tried and failed over the years, so let's talk about what customers have done that have been successful and what they, what they can do. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about condition monitoring, and we've already introduced the, the concept of how it pushes from reactive to more proactive. So there's a lot of terms here. So just to clarify, proactive maintenance is anything that's not reactive. So, and, and one thing I wanna also clarify here is um, not every asset or application needs predictive maintenance. And, and what we really want to do is we want to evaluate or, or do a criticality survey of our assets and find out because there's some machines that we need to stay with reactive maintenance. There's some assets that need to be preventive and some should be predictive. So how do we know that? Well, we prioritize by criticality and also by our failure modes. You know, we don't want to just go out and start doing condition monitoring and just do, yeah, starting from the ground up is a long, tedious, expensive way to troubleshoot a machine. Instead, we want to think about what are the failure modes. So think about your car. You go out to start your car up in the morning and it doesn't start. The first thing you do is you check for gas, you check for battery, you might even get to the point where you check for filters, you know, but you're sure not going to jump into the fuel injectors and, and tear the engine apart. So it's the same thing with our machinery, you know. Sometimes we have to go for where the most obvious and most critical faults are, and troubleshooting should be getting rid of the most important, the most logical, and the ones that are probably going to be the fault. We don't want to spend time looking at a problem that isn't going to be there, okay? Um, and so, and some of the things we also need to think about is, you know, how do we get buy-in from leadership? You know, anytime we do this is going to be a business decision, but keep in mind, changing corporate ideas sometimes can be difficult. So sometimes we have to start small and grow, you know, sometimes we have to start with a pilot program, just do a few machines and show some success. What technologies? Because there's a lot of different technologies and we're going to talk during the presentation a little bit more about technologies, skill sets, um, wireless sensors, and different types of applications. Okay. So when you talk about condition monitoring, it's really all about getting a baseline of what is good, then trending over time to, uh, to see something is going on. We may not know exactly what it is, but we know that something has changed from when it was good and then finally, analysis. We want to investigate and find out, okay, we've got a problem. Let's find out what that problem is and what to fix it and how to find the root cause. And so let's talk a little bit more about this, uh, you know, baseline trending and analysis. Okay. So condition monitoring, what that gives us is it gives us more eyes down on the floor and around the clock because Failures happen at two o'clock in the morning. They don't happen on day shift when everybody is there. So we need to be able to 
have indications of what's going on all the time or else that means we have to have somebody on the floor all the time. And so it would sure be nice if we could have some technology help us out and tell us what's going on. So that's what we talk about remote monitoring. You know, and the nice thing about doing this is with today's communication networking and, and all of the, the cell phones and all the cloud-based stuff, we can now start sharing that information over the cloud and not have to keep it siloed away in somebody's drawer that nobody has access to. Real-time alarming, real-time measurements. Um, we need to know right away when something is going on. So we're going to talk about how these remote sensors can give technicians, not vibration, not experts, you don't have to be an expert to know how to use these things, but give you critical information so that you can then be able to uh, act on it. And there's some places where we don't have access to using portable data collectors. So we want to talk about how we can get data from all machines. And alarming needs to be maybe not continuous or real time or all the time, but we need to have it more frequently than once a month or once a quarter or at worst, once a year when the consultant comes out. So we just need to get more information more often. Thanks, John. We're going to launch this poll to get a little more information about our audience again. Um, so let me do that. Um, and everyone, please answer. Uh, what level of interest do you have in learning about wireless remote monitoring? Um, very interested, interested, a little interested, neutral or not interested at all. And um, we've got about a little more than half the folks who have voted. We're approaching 75%, so we'll do another minute. Well, no, not a minute, a few seconds. All right, we're going to close the poll now. Let's look at the results. Great. 48% uh, are very interested, 39% interested, 8% a little interested, 4% neutral, and then 1% not interested at all. So that gives us some feedback there, John. And um, let's go on okay. to the next uh, part of the webinar. All right, thanks. Okay, so we kind of talked about this at the very beginning. You know, what do we do in today's environment where we're all having to do more with less. Well, let's think about uh, this as a way of, uh, let's look at other industries. If you think about the um, medical industry, how do they do it? How they, right now the medical industry has found a solution and that solution is how do you, how do you give treatment to millions of patients with a limited number of specialists? Well, they've had to be creative, and what they do is they use kind of a, uh, a level, a tiered approach, which means that first we use nurses to screen out if, if, a, if a patient is healthy. Then we use general practice doctors to diagnose the most common faults, uh, cuts, bruises, broken bones, viruses, flus, you know, the, the most common things. And then we use our specialist our uh, surgeons and our heart surgeons and our, and our cancer specialists only when needed. Well, we should use, do that same approach when we look at our machines in our plants. Because if you think about it, only the machines at the top tier, just those few very, very complex and critical machines, really need to have an expert that's there to babysit that machine. Things like uh, the main power turbine, machine, a paper machine, machining tools, or the other machines in the plant, a good, probably 90 or 95 percent of the machines, and this all depends on your industry, of course, but most of the machines are pretty standard machines. Motors, pumps, fans, compressors, blowers, and they really aren't that exotic or, 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 or you know, or that, uh, that hard to maintain. So, um, if we look at that, why don't we do the same thing the medical industry does, and that is, with our machines, let's first start by screening out which machines have problems. Because if you think about it, eight, by you know, generally, 80% of machines are going to be healthy. So we don't want to analyze a healthy machine. We don't want to correct a healthy machine. So by using simple screening tools, we're going to screen out in just a few seconds 
which machines are healthy. And that leaves about 20% have a problem. Well, of those 20%, then we're going to diagnose just 20%, which means we have a much smaller amount. And of those 20% that are bad, we're going to find out that just like a doctor, most problems with machines, there's only four or five. And if you think about rotating machine, those four or five are imbalance, misalignment, looseness, and bearings. So why don't we try to go for the big 90% that are, number one, very common, and number two, easy for us to repair ourselves, and we don't have to call in an expert to take care of it. And then finally, always, after we do a repair, we want to make sure that we validate that repair before we return a machine to service. So if over 90% of the faults that we find with rotating machinery are easy to repair, that means that 10% or less are complex, and those 10%, we would then refer off to a specialist. So just like the nurse, doctor, cancer specialist, let's screen out our machines with our on-site staff using simple tools and then use diagnostic tools that are easy to use for our technicians to be able to find most of the problems. So how do we get answers from vibration sensors with minimal training and time investment? So let's take a look at, we've already introduced the idea of the screening process. So let's take a look at the people that would be using these different tools. So if you think about it, you only need the expert on the, the top few machines. An experienced technician can diagnose 90% of the machines and over 90% of the faults and we use entry level technicians like a nurse to be able to go around and do quick checks so that we know which ones our technicians should be focusing on. Now, if you look at the tools that each of these people would be using, we'd use simple screening tools that the operator or technician would use to do the screening. The experienced technician would use full feature diagnostic tools leaving the advanced analysis tools for the experts to use on those very few critical machines. Finally, let's look at the training, because let's put this in perspective. Everybody wants to have their own expert, but is that really feasible, especially in today's environment? So if you think about it, an expert vibration analyst takes two or three weeks of training, five years to get experienced, and it takes 30 to 40 minutes for a vibration expert to measure the data, analyze it, compare, build baselines. That's a lot of time and energy and resources that most of us just don't have. When you think about it though, diagnosing a fault, the training is much, much less. Maybe eight hours, it's self-paced, and the diagnosis only takes 10 or 15 minutes. And then finally, if you look at screening, Screening, you can do the training in less than 30 minutes and you can measure in a matter of seconds. So if you, if you do that comparison, you can see, just like a nurse, doctor, and a brain surgeon, it really makes sense to screen out our problems first and then move up to a diagnostic and then move up to uh, the final step. <laughs> now, wireless sensors, um, are a good way to be able to do this screening without having to have a technician walk around to all the machines. So there's, over the years, we've been trying to find ways to move or push the screening and the diagnosis to the machine because if we can do that at the machine level, getting data or getting information from the machine using walk-around pro programs are always going to be take more time, take more labor, take more resources. So we all want to try to find a way to move that screening and diagnosis as close to the machine as we possibly can. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about vibration sensors. So from this drawing, this, uh, this photo you can see over here, you can see that we have these sensors on the pump and the motor, and if you, uh, I don't know if my mouse pointer is showing up, but you can see on the end of the pump there is a sensor on the end of the motor, and then over on this machine on the top of the motor, 
and on the top of a pump or a vibration sensor. And then over here is a gateway. So these sensors would be talking, would be collecting data <coughs> near real, real time, screening the information, sending this information to the gateway, and then the gateway would be sending this information up to the cloud so that the user would be able to have this information available to them and you would be able to see this baseline data, the trend data, the graphs would all be showing up on your iPad or your iPhone or your Android device and that way you have all this data coming to you instead of you having to go out once a month or once a quarter or once a year and capturing this data. And so the advantage is early warning. We know sooner, we know better, and if information is, is power, information is king, the more we know, the better we can make our repairs. All right, so we want to identify information early, and the earlier we can make our repairs, the better, because early repairs um, save labor, save cost, save machines, save production. Also, we want to target, um, you know, a small number of, of parts, and well, we've already talked about that. So if we can find a fault, so for example, if we let a machine go until the bearing is no longer doing its job and you start damaging the shaft, we let that keep going and now it, you have a catastrophic failure. If we could have fixed that back when the bearing was first starting to wear, we would have been game ahead, way ahead in the game. So if you look at this prevention failure curve over on the right, this curve has been around for, for years and years and years. And this is a good way to explain using different technologies and why we would use different technologies on rotating machinery. And this is a conceptional curve. It's not a curve to say, hey, you know, there's no time, even though it says time down at the bottom, this is conceptional to give you an idea. So if you think about a machine, when it first starts to wear up at the top in the green, it takes months or even years for it to go from when it starts to show signs of wear until it finally fails way over on the right. Now, years ago, we used to say, let's try to get as much life out of a machine as we can. So it was all a game in that we would say, let's wait until we get audible noise or hot to the touch. But the problem with playing that game is it's risky. The, that, that game of waiting until it makes noise, well, what happens if the plant is too noisy and we don't hear the noise? Or what if that noise shows up and you don't have enough warning? Or people ignore that noise? And the other, there's two other problems with, with waiting until, you know, using that risk assessment of waiting until the, last, the, the, the machine is on its last legs and about to go. The other problem is the cost to repair is exponentially higher. The damage is already done. So you can see that here in about the yellow zone, the damage is already starting to happen. And if we let it get into the orange or red, that means instead of just replacing a bearing, now we've got to replace the shaft or the entire motor. So the cost to repair is exponential. The other thing is energy waste. A machine that's even running a little bit rougher is going to use a lot more energy. So we just can't afford to run machines until they fail. We can't run them until they're just about to fail. So that's why we have these different technologies, oil analysis, ultrasound, vibration, electrical, and thermography. And why are we talking about vibration? Well, vibration is good because it finds the fault early in the cycle and you can watch it go to the later stages. Where sometimes ultrasound, and not to say that ultrasound is bad, what I'm saying is ultrasound is going to find it very, very early, but too early. There's a certain point where with ultrasound you're going to know that you've got some bearings starting to wear, but it's really time to grease the bearing, not replace the bearing. If you replace the bearing too early, well, now what's going to happen is you're going to have an angry maintenance person bring the bearings in and drop them off on your desk 
and say, there's nothing wrong with these bearings. Why did you tell me to replace them? So we need to be smart about this. So use ultrasound as an early warning and use that to grease the bearings. Then when the, con when the bearings continue to wear, we're going to see that show up in vibration. When I was analyzing bearings in the Navy and working for a vibration consultant for many years, we were tracking using vibration bearings would wear over an 18 month or, or two year period. We could see a bearing go from slight to moderate to serious to extreme and it was many, many, many months. So that gives you plenty of time to start making your plans. So when you see it come up as slight, you don't run out there and, and overhaul the, the bearing. You keep an eye on it. And as it moves to moderate, then we collect data more frequently. And as it moves to serious, then we think about scheduling for the next downtime. And when it gets to extreme, then we say, okay, now it's time to pull the trigger, time to repair that machine because we don't want to let that bearing get too bad because if we let it get too bad, then we're going to have more damage happen. But being able to watch that go from slight to moderate to serious to extreme over an 18-month period, now we can be smarter and better about our planning and fix machines when, when we need to uh, and not run into problems. Okay, I think we're all done, and so I'm going to turn this over to Lori to see if we have any questions. Thanks, John. Um, we do have some questions, and um, we have got a good time for questions, so if you have any that you haven't asked us, please uh, type them into the question bar, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. The first question I have is, how do we start a proactive program when we are already busy with PMs and corrective repairs? That's a good question, and that's the, the question that everybody asks, and uh, um, I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit in my uh, presentation, but, but uh, uh, I think this is important because you're already busy, and everybody says the same thing. I'm already 100% busy, how can I possibly take time to go start a, a proactive maintenance program? I don't have time to do anything the way I have right now. So the answer to that question is start small and grow. Because if you try to start a proactive maintenance program on all 5,000 machines in your plant at once, it's going to take you months to do it. And by the time you e don't even get partway through it, someone's going to ask you where the results and the program is going to be canceled. So the, 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 the successful customers that we've had that, were, that have been successful have told us what they do is they start with a small group of machines. Sometimes you want to do that under the radar of, of, of management so that because you have only enough time, so just start with a few machines. Start with a pilot program. And if you start with a few machines, that gives you a little bit of time, and then you find some success, and then you go in and wave the flag to everybody. You say, look at what I did. I've, I've, on these 20 machines, I've been collecting data for the past three months. I've saved this uh, machine. It saved X amount of dollars or X amount of production time. And document your saves, wave the flag. Then you can get buy-in, then you can get budget, and then you can grow the program. So the successful customers are those that uh, start small and grow their program over time. Oh, one more point, sorry. Um, the other benefit of starting small and growing is as you start getting some wins, and as you start getting your, your, your trending and condition-based maintenance program starting to go, you'll start to learn a few things on those machines. One thing is the repairs are going to be less. They're going to be diminished. So you're going to start getting a little bit extra time there. You're also going to start freeing up some time because you'll realize that if you're able to catch problems in advance, you may no long, you may find that some of the PMs you were doing on those first 20 machines aren't necessary anymore. So if you can start reducing the time it takes for repairs and PMs on those few machines, you can take that time to now start doing more machines. So that's what I mean by start small and grow. Do a few machines, get yourself some time, 
do some more machines, get yourself some more time, so that over a few months, now you're starting to do more and more of the plant proactively, and less and less of the plant is done reactively or doing PMs. And you're never going to get away with never doing PMs or never doing run to failure. So I'm not saying stop all PMs on these machines. What I'm saying is learn from the trending, learn from the condition of the machine, and learn which PMs, and so modify your PMs. Some PMs you'll have to keep, but some you can modify and no longer use. All right, thanks. Thanks, John. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, the next one we have is exactly how do the sensors work? Okay, um, so from the image that we showed you earlier, uh, and you can go to that if you if you like. So how do they work? So if you look at that little yellow sensor on the end of the bearing, we would mount this sensor on the machine and it would collect vibration and over time uh, and, and also temperature and so we would be able to watch and over time kind of learn what is good for this machine and do a little bit of machine learning and we would then be able to know over time by trending what is you know that we're starting to have a problem once we start to have a problem, because remember, the first step of doing uh, um, machine, co you know, condition-based maintenance is knowing which machines are good or bad. So before we call in somebody to come diagnose this machine, let's screen out and find out which ones are good or bad. So the first step is using these sensors to screen out machines. So basically, this sensor is going to be monitoring these machines sending the data to that gateway. The gateway then sends it up to the cloud and then it comes down to your tablet or your PC and you're going to be able to watch the trends. You're going to be able to see when things start getting bad and then it's time for you to go down there with a tool to, kind of, to do some more testing. All right, thanks. Um, the next question, you may want to stay on that slide. The next question is, can you talk about the best locations for placing vibration sensors? Do you need them at both ends of the shaft, both ends sure. of the motor? Those are, good, those are good questions. So, a couple of things. The easy answer is anywhere on the bearing, okay? And I know a lot of people say, well, I don't know where to put it on the bearing. Well, these, these sensors are triaxial, which means they're going to measure all three directions at the same time. So it's not like years ago we used single channel sensors, which meant that you wanted to real, you had to really strategically place the sensor because it was only doing one direction. Because if you think about a rotating shaft, it vibrates up and down, side to side, and end to end. So we'd like to be able to see the movement or the vibration in all three directions because we, we might miss part of, the, of what's going on. So by using a triaxial sensor, we're able to get all three directions at once. Now, that means that we can either put it on the top, on the side, or on the end of the bearing. So the short answer is anywhere on the bearing that's solid metal because vibration from the rotating shaft transmits down the shaft to the bearing, into the bearing housing, and into our sensor. So the only way the vibration can get from the shaft on the inside to the sensor on the outside is from the bearings. So you have to mount it on the bearings. It's got to be on solid metal of the bearings, not on a cooling fan cover, not on fins, not on thin metal, but on the solid metal housing of the bearings. Now, we need one, on, well, we need to get vibration from both shafts of the, of the machine if possible. You don't have to have it from every bearing. So if you think about it, vibration transmits about 30 inches down a shaft. So that means that with these machines, these are, you know, 25, 30 horsepower motors driving pumps, so you can see we have one on the motor and one on the pump. 
So that means that the one sensor on the pump is going to be able to see vibration from both bearings. So vibration from both pump bearings will transmit to that one sensor. There's no need to put a sensor on every single bearing. It's only when you have very large machines. So if I have a large motor, like let's say 100 horsepower, then I probably have a large pump, and that means that I need to put a sensor on all the bearings because vibration won't transmit from one bearing to another. Okay, I think that answers that question. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, we are getting a lot of questions about um, can the data be visualized in the EMAC CMMS? Um, is there a dedicated software tool? I know the answer to that is yes on both, but could you um, explain how the new Emate Explorer um, has, can now integrate the data from the sensors and the tools um, to this, or is this something we should probably, um, you know, send some more information about? Well, yeah, that's probably the answer, but let me turn this over to uh, another, someone else here on the team because I'm not the expert in that, so let's have, have uh, Frederick Bodar answer that question for you. Yeah, hey, Laurie, good morning. This is uh, this is Frederick Bodar. I'm one of the application specialists with the Fluke, uh, with the Fluke team. To answer that question, uh, <clears throat> um, we actually, this is something that we're working on it. So currently, um, we have a very, very few amount of sensors that can actually connect directly to the CMMS and upload the data. One being then it will be the, uh, the temperature one, but in terms of the vibrations or even thermal imager, it is, it's on the roadmap for early 2018, but not as of December 2017. So it's definitely something that we, we are working on hard on it, but um, it, it's coming. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, um, do the gateways work off Wi-Fi only? I be believe so. I believe that the sensors are Bluetooth low energy, and that would send the signal from the, uh, the sensor to the gateway, and then the gateway uses Wi-Fi to get it up to the cloud. Now, if you're in a in a location where you don't have good gate a, a good Wi-Fi signal, then you can always get a a MiFi or something like that. And uh, if you're in a like a boiler room or, a, or an area where there's or it's in the basement and there's a lot of machines down there, then you may get away with only one or two MiFis to be able to handle all the gateways to handle all the sensors. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, can we use can we use vibration analysis for correcting lubrication practices? Um, yes and no. Um, the sensor in its uh, well, so in the high frequencies, you can find um, that, uh, like we like we talked about earlier, you know, the ultrasound, the ultra high frequencies, is where the bearing first starts to show its wear, and it's not until it gets into the later stages, when it gets into the lower frequencies, that replacement of the bearing is necessary. But in the higher frequencies, that's when we recommend to check the greasing of the bearing. So um, usually that's better, a better tool for, for ultrasound because, and again, really there are multiple technologies and we want to match the correct technology with the expected failure mode. So um, even though vibration could be used uh, as a tool to look for early warning of, of, of bearings and use for lubrication, ultrasound is probably the better tool. And I would say that on the other side of that, 
knowing when the bearing has degraded to a point where it needs to be uh, replaced is a better application for vibration. So um, you could use a vibration sensor that had a very high frequency band to do some lubrication checking, but that's probably not what you would want to do, and uh, that's probably not what most sensors are designed to do. So I would probably say use ultrasound um, would be a better application. Thanks, John. Um, I have three questions that kind of tend to talk about maintaining the sensors, um, so I'm going to ask them together and maybe you can cover them all at one time. The question is, do you need, do we need PMs for the sensors? How do you maintain them? And how are the sensors calibrated? Okay, so let me attempt to uh, answer those and then we'll see if, uh, if I need to get some help from Frederick or not. So, so the answer is uh, vibration sensors, um, wireless vibration sensors, these vibration sensors um, have a battery that's going to last for three to five years and depending on of course how frequently you ping them and want to get answers from them. So the, the, the short answer is no. There is no maintenance, there is no PM, there is, there is no, no need to go uh, check in on these sensors because they're self-reliant and they're just going to keep chugging along, sending information. Um, if you, uh, and, and you don't need to have data from a, from a sensor every second or every minute or every hour, if you think about it, a portable walk-around system is only measuring a machine once, once a month or once a quarter. So collecting data, and, and, and think about it, if we collect data every second, is somebody going to be reading that every second? I don't think so. Think about it. We really want to get answers out of our data, and if you have reams and reams and reams of data coming in, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, you know. If, if you throw more uh, hay on there, it doesn't make finding any needle any easier. So we really need to, to be smarter about the data coming. So, so I think that was kind of a long way of me saying that we only need to collect data once a day, really, or, or maybe even less for these sensors to really be effective and to, be, to tell us because a fault on a machine doesn't happen overnight it takes weeks or months for the fault to, tr to transpire. So three to five years for this sensor is going to be fine. Now the calibration issue. Calibration isn't really needed on a vibration sensor. Why? Because there isn't anything that makes it go out of calibration. And when we use a portable walk-around system, there's a chance for dropping it. And that's really the only reason that you would have for something to go out of calibration is if you dropped it and broke it. Well, this wireless sensor is mounted securely to the bearing of the machine and we're not removing it, it's, it's staying there. And so there really is no need to break that sensor off of the bearing of the machine and send it in to get it calibrated because there's nothing that's gonna make it go out of calibration. So the answer is you don't need to calibrate it and you don't need to maintain it. You put it on there, it's good to go. And uh, another thing to think about is when you would know that something was needed with that sensor, you're going to know because it's going to stop sending you data. It's not like it's going to start sending you weird data. It's, gonna, it, it's either going to give you data or it's not going to give you data. And when it stops giving you data, then you know there's something wrong and it's time to go out there. And if it's been several years, the answer is you're probably going to just put another sensor on there because it's probably like, like a lot of things, it costs more to break that thing open and put a new battery in it than it is just to put a new sensor on there. Okay. So I think I answered that. Frederick, anything else you want to add or did I cover it? Okay. I think we're done. Thanks. All right, thanks, guys. Um, 
I have a question that may need both of you to answer this, you and Frederick. Um, I think there are, the question is, what's the difference between vibration versus thermographic studies? Like when would you use one versus the other? Okay, I'll, let me take first crack at that. And, and so on rotating machinery, vibration is probably our number one technology and thermography is our number two. On electrical, I would say thermography is by far the number one choice and the number one used. Well, you would never use vibration on electrical anyway. Uh, you know, process and other things, you're going to use. So thermography is best used in electrical applications, process applications, a wide variety of applications, and it's a good use to supplement the vibration on rotating machinery. Now, the mistake that some customers do is they say, I only want to have one technology and I want to do everything with it. And they go out and buy a thermal camera because it's easy to be, anybody can look at a thermal image. So it's easy, it's fast, and they say, I'm doing predictive maintenance because I've got a thermal camera. But you saw from that curve that we showed you earlier that thermography is going to find, now this is just for rotating machinery, so I'm not talking about electrical or process, but just for rotating machinery, thermography is going to find a mechanical fault very late in the cycle of, of, of the fault, and sometimes that might be too close to the failure of a machine. So I would recommend using ultrasound to, for greasing the bearings, vibration to track the bearings and the couplings and the, and the mechanical problems, and then in the later stages, just before failure, use thermography as a way to back up or supplement, because what I've seen is quite often, by the time you see a very hot bearing or a hot compressor or a hot coupling, I would have already wanted to know that with vibration. Now, I'm not going to be able to see electrical problems in that motor with vibration. So that means you need to use them both. So don't just use one tool and try to do everything with it. Use the right tool for the right expected failure mode. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, um, in the vein of thermography and infrared, someone asked that um, they also want to use continuous um, monitoring. Um, can you and Frederick kind of go over, they want to know what all sensors are available right now from, from us that they could use to monitor their equipment. I'll let Frederick answer that. For continuous monitoring, <clears throat> so for continuous monitoring we have a number of sensors that we have currently released and also some that we are about to release in 2018. Um, we have the uh, electrical, so AC, DC, uh, voltage and current. We have the temperature, a small temperature sensor. We have the uh, uh, 3540 power monitor, which is essentially a basic uh, logger capability uh, for three phase. And then we have the thermal imager, who was uh, recently uh, released uh, sometime in early uh, Q3 or Q4. Um, um, and also that's a thermal imager on itself, so it can be managed just about anywhere. And you can use this for continuous monitoring with various interval of capturing the data. Um, it has battery as well as uh, power, and then obviously the, uh, the vibration sensor. So we have a series of sensors, and, and in 2018 we also have planned to, to expand to other types of sensor and technologies in that aspect as we go. Thanks, Frederick. Um, the next question, um, we probably have time for one more. Um, does the monitoring software for the vibration sensor tell the user the seriousness of the problem, or does the user need some experience to interpret the um, data that they receive? That's a, that's a good question. So as we kind of show, talked about earlier, these wireless sensors are really more for screening rather than analyzing, okay? 
So there are sensors out there, very high-end sensors, um, and, and so remember that the features and the capabilities um, and the training and the experience are all, you know, they all track whether you want to screen the fault, whether you want to diagnose the fault, or whether you want to analyze the fault. So for this purpose of, of screening the fault, which is what these sensors are designed to do, which is the, the first step, remember the nurse, the first thing we want to do is know if the machine is good or bad, because if we can get rid of, so, so for those, it's not going to be doing any analysis. It's not going to be doing much in the way of a, of a severity. It's really just telling us that the machine is good or bad. It's really just saying, hey, you know, the vibration levels are going up. You need to go check on this machine. So there is some machine learning in the sensor in that it, it knows, you know, kind of what are the random, what's the noise? So we don't want to have us have you be an alarmed on, uh, you know, uh, some noise in the area or uh, a, 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 a forklift going by or something crazy like that. So it is going to be telling us that, hey, something about this machine is starting to, to it needs further investigation. So uh, in the point that it, it, it's telling us that, we need to go, it's either good or bad. Now, later on, um, you know, in, in other modules coming down, uh, you know, through the years, I would envision, and even though I don't know what our roadmap is going to be, you know, um, maybe we go to a, a diagnostic tool, or maybe we go to something where we get some, uh, some analysis features. But, but for now, we want to do the first step in that screen in the machine, um, and so the idea would be if we can remotely screen out and tell you whether it's good or bad, that means we don't have to walk around and screen all these machines. And once we find out that there's something potentially wrong, now a technician can be called out to go and check on it and they can take their portable tool with them. And, and for example, they could diagnose. So if you, once you screen out 80% of the problems, then you would walk out with a vibration tester and do a 10 or 15 minute test and you would diagnose that machine and go, oh, okay, it does have some high vibration, but it's not a fault. And so I don't need to overhaul this machine yet. But uh, while I was standing there, I noticed that it was making a lot of noise and I think that the pump, the valve lineup was bad. So. There, there's always some good benefit to having a technician go check on a machine. So the answer is, I know I talked a bit about it, but, but the answer really is, no, it's not going to give you the severity. It's going to tell you whether the machine is good or bad. Thanks, John. Um, I think that is all the time we have uh, for this webinar. Thank you so much, um, John, Fluke, and Maine, and RSD for being here. There will be a brief survey that will display on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar. We would appreciate it if you would take a few moments to complete it to ensure that we are presenting content that you find relevant and helpful. Thanks again for joining us and have a great afternoon.